it will prevent mishaps in the future from ever happening. Things that are kind of routine today that you hear about will go away because of this. This technology is a real game changer. Welcome to the Weekly Defence Podcast, the show about defence procurement and military technology. We are brought to you in partnership with our sponsor, NAMO. I'm your host, Helen Haxel, Air Domain Editor here at Shepherd Media, coming to you this week from Stockholm in Sweden. On the show this week, we cover all the latest from the co-located iTech UDT an EW Europe event in Stockholm. Tim Martin, senior reporter, speaks with Sikorsky's test pilot, John Rusi, about the CH-53K King Stallion and what it's like to fly that heavy lift helicopter during its recent set of flight tests. And our sponsor, NAMO, provides this week's Industry Voice segment. But first, our weekly news roundup, which this week is brought to you by our editor-in-chief, Richard Thomas and the team, who are covering Imdex Asia in Singapore. Thanks, Ellen. Yes, indeed, I'm back at the Changi Exhibition Centre in Singapore for Imdex Asia 2019. Delighted to be joined by Gordon Arthur, Asia-Pacific editor, and Matt Smith, head of analysis. Gordon, over to you first on the news side of things. What have you heard? What have you seen? What's caught your eye? Well, there was just a, a few things that we discovered here at the show. Um, ST Engineering, uh, previously known as ST Marine, was showing a, a couple of new products. Uh, the newest to their family of Vanguard surface competence was the Vanguard 130. Now, Richard, I, I did notice that the, the image that they had of this new Vanguard 130 pretty much exactly mirrors what the Singapore Navy is looking for uh, for its multi-role combat vessel. And a feature of this ship is that it will include lots of unmanned systems, which will probably get you quite excited. So UAVs, USVs, uh, UUVs as well. So that, that was interesting. Uh, they, they were unveiling that particular design. They also had a new series of fast interceptor boats, which they're calling the Super Swift series. So they have about five different sizes available, and we believe that they have a a customer, a regional customer, for one of those types. Another highlight for me personally was to go aboard the HMAS Canberra. So that's one of Australia's two LHDs, and it was here at Imdex. In fact, it was in Singapore for the very first time. So we had a chance to go aboard. We had a chance to interview the Air Commodore aboard the Canberra. And the ship is actually on its longest ever deployment. So it's a three-month deployment around Asia. So it's been to Sri Lanka, India, Malaysia, Thailand, Vietnam, and here now in Singapore. And they have four Tiger helicopters and a couple of MRH-90 helicopters on board. So that was pretty exciting. And I'm sure there's been lots of exciting things for you too. So would you like to tell us about some of those? I'll try, Gordon. I will, yeah. Okay. Um, I guess, first off, actually, I just want to raise, raise the point. Um, again, we've come to Singapore, and, and, and again, there hasn't been an awful lot in the way of news. There have been lots of platforms been displayed and technology showcased, but announcements for programs from are used for information or anything like that has been few and far between nevertheless uh, we've we've tried hard as, as as we always do to uncover different technologies which might be breaking into various sectors uh, from my side um, a very interesting piece from Dras defense they're an Italian submarine manufacturer design uh, OEM and manufacturer um, they're building multiples of their 30 to 40 meter midget and compact submarines for very very undisclosed customers I couldn't even get an idea as to what region that these guys might be in. Um, nevertheless, uh, the, the company Dress said the, the advantage of having uh, midget and compact subs was that you get multiple versions of these uh, boats for the cost of a single SSK. Now, if you think about the you know, countries in this region might be struggling or struggling limited in terms of how much they can spend, the idea of getting multiple versions of anything 
for a relatively low um, cost must be attractive, particularly when you, when you think about these, these platforms, these uh, boats. The crew sizes are limited to sort of 9 or 12 or 15. So, yeah, bang per buck, very good systems. Um, another one that uh, I uh, came across was Vard Marine. Now, this is a Fincantieri company. Uh, they've identified um, a possible, what they think might be a possible replacement for the protector class OPVs. Those are operated by the Royal New Zealand uh, Navy. Um, now, these uh, protector OPVs, they're 85 metres, but they, they're, they're being operated in, in and around the southern seas and the Arctic. This is obviously very, very big seas with a lot of, a lot of ice maybe to uh, contend with. So uh, Vard Marines say that a larger platform is probably better suited to operating in that environment and they identified the, uh, the 110 offshore patrol vessel that they've designed. Now, this design actually has been uh, used or will be used by the U.S. Coast Guard for their offshore patrol cutter um, and would be, well, again, they say very, very um, uh, applicable to what the Royal New Zealand Navy might need for the protector replacement. Matt, you've been incredibly busy with some conferences and high-level stuff. Uh, if you could just fill us in, what's been going on from your side? Yes, it's been uh, it's been a particularly busy show um, uh, for for me this year. Uh, we've been asked to moderate a couple of conferences: um, one on cybersecurity uh, in the maritime domain, and another one on innovation. We ran those today, uh, and we had some really excellent speakers. Uh, we came up with some actually quite insightful comments. Um, particularly, I mean, well, if, if I start off with the cybersecurity, um, so we had panelists there from the military, uh, we had from industry and also from the, uh, so the, the non-military naval community as well. So we had a range of different um, perspectives coming into it. And one of the things that was most prominent in the discussion was just the range of threats that naval vessels face in the maritime domain. And, you know, the panel discussed about uh, the people angle, so um, you know, how, do, how do you control um, access to ships, um, particularly during the maintenance cycle? Uh, so one of, the, one of our panels discussed uh, the threat from having effectively contractors coming in to do your maintenance uh, who are probably subject to less security requirements than perhaps um, your full-time staff or, or, or main military staff. And they're able to wander around the ship and perhaps can access systems and, and, and infect them with, uh, with either viruses or uh, other forms of, um, of, of cyber threat. Um, Captain Eric Pittman from the US Navy talked quite a lot about the, uh, the, the threat from connectivity. So um, his, uh, one of his principal concerns, he's a sub submariner, um, uh, and his, from his perspective, the, um, the constant connectivity of the naval ship across all the different networks, um, both within a vessel itself, but also from ship to ship and ship to shore, uh, really is a, 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 sort of a, a threat vector when you're in a submarine you broadcast once every now and again so nobody knows where you are uh, and nobody can track you um, and nobody can plot what your movements are with these modern ships uh, you're broadcasting your position virtually all the time and so your enemy's ability to uh, either intercept or use those communications is itself uh, a threat to that, that vessel so I thought that was a particularly interesting um, perspective and one of the ways that he discussed in, um, uh, in, to combat that was really, well, there, there were th three kind of principal areas. One was uh, agility, so to not maintain the same transmission bands, to constantly frequency hop, to make sure that you are not just fall falling to the same patterns. Um, the second was transmission discipline, so just don't be constantly online. Um, do what the subbarners do and just broadcast every now and again. And the, the third was cyber discipline. So just making sure, and this is more of the people angle, that everyone on that ship understands the risks um, that are involved in actually um, in, in transmissions protocols. So you know, he had a, a very uh, comprehensive view of actually how to protect the, those vessels, um, particularly in the transmission sense. The second panel we had was on um, innovation in the maritime domain. And again, we had a, a broad range of panelists uh, from defence industry and from outside industry as well. I think um, one of the key takeaways from, from that session was really uh, how important the innovation process is to the organisations that um, develop things, um, with a particular focus on uh, how, how important it is to maintain a quick turnaround. 
So a lot of the presentations were concentrated on how do you shorten your innovation cycle? How do you make sure that you can deliver the next level of innovation, the next level of product into a platform? Um, and Naval Group were talking about doing that within a three-year cycle, which given the lifespan of some of these platforms is probably quite a challenge. The other, one, one, one of the other areas that we, uh, we sort of heard quite a lot about was how do you, as a defence company, um, internalise that innovation process? Uh, defence companies, well, certainly at the higher end, tend to be fairly large organisations with um, a quite substantial number of regulations and protocols in place, and often that is the enemy of innovation. And so we talked about how they are able to partner, use SMEs, use disruptors, uh, and integrate those kinds of organisations into their structures, if not necessarily their, um, their, their, their corporate environment, and leverage them that way. Yeah, Matt, um, absolutely. Uh, Naval Group, just, just uh, previously, they, they sort of uh, announced uh, the We Startup um, uh, Singapore programme, where, as you say, they're, they're looking for, for mobile companies to kind of provide that disruptive technology, and they'll work that into their own overall programmes. Interesting stuff. Gentlemen, thanks very much for your time. I appreciate that. Um, uh, for, our, for our viewers, listeners, readers, whatever we call them here on a podcast, um, we've actually got a, a question for you. We've, we've, uh, we've had a think about it, and between the combined knowledge of Shepherd Media, which is hundreds if not thousands of years of defence, uh, millions of years indeed, um, we don't know why ship names are italicised in copy. Now, we've spent the entire week doing that on the show daily and in our stories, but if anyone out there can uh, direct us as to why this is the case, we would be eternally grateful. Thank you very much for spending time and listening with us. Catch you again soon. I'm here with Pete Rawlins, the account director here at Shepherd Media. So, Pete, the question on everyone's lips is, what's the state of play in the exciting world of advertising sales? Thanks, Alan. Uh, well, we've seen a number of changes over the last decade or so um, from the advent of kind of new uh, digital advertising solutions outside of just the regular web banners and emails uh, to the resurgence of print advertising uh, and mixed multimedia campaigns. Against that backdrop, Shepard's portfolio of print and digital products provide a tangible and targeted advertising platform to niche sectors within defence and aerospace. Uh, and clients value the comprehensive analysis we provide after any digital advertising delivery. Uh, this kind of allows them to measure ROI and campaign effectiveness. But against that digital delivery, there's still a place for print advertising, right? Yeah, that's right. Um, our established print products are also a highlight on many client calendars, uh, especially with extensive event distribution at major events across our range of magazines and annual industry guides, uh, which are well recognised and sought after. Well, there you have it. If you'd like to hear more about how you can take advantage of our advertising platforms, then please do visit the advertising section of our website. Deputy Land Editor Beth Mondrell and I are in Stockholm, Sweden for the co-located UDT, otherwise known as Undersea Defence Technology Event, AOC EW Europe and iTech 2019. Before we hear from some of the speakers and companies that are present here in Stockholm, at AOCEW Europe, Anglo-Italian company Leonardo announced that its Bright Cloud 218 had been selected by the USDOD for its foreign comparative testing programme. What does this mean? Well, the expendable active decoy will be evaluated and assessed over a two to three year time frame. The first phase of Bright Cloud under this programme will be an evaluation in a laboratory before it progresses into airborne trials from the F-16s. Now, the general purpose of this is for US defence to trial and analyse products before embarking on its application to a US platform. The fact that Bright Cloud has been extensively tested by UK aircraft is only likely better to serve the US trials. Undersea Defence Technology is also a key segment of the event here in Stockholm, Sweden. Beth, what did you unearth at the conference? Yep, so today I've been covering the conference at UDT here in Stockholm and um, 
obviously because of the nature of it being in Sweden, there was a lot of focus on Swedish uh, programmes. Notably, an update was provided on the A26, uh, two new submarines that the Swedish Navy is procuring from Saab Kockhams. Now, the contract was originally awarded in 2015, and to be honest with you, things have been going relatively well, um, as they would with such a programme um, to date. Um, but what um, was discussed at the conference was that the expected sea trial dates um, of the first submarine will begin in 2022 and the second the following year in 2023. Um, the speaker um, from the uh, Ministry of Defence also went through all like the unique capabilities of the A26, including uh, new counter uh, mine countermeasure capabilities although he did note that of course you wouldn't really s send a submarine that costs this much into a minefield so what it'll be used for more so is sending smaller platforms out via its flexible payload lock what was interesting though was uh, the speaker was asked why only two new submarines um, which would give Sweden ultimately four as it continues to upgrade its Gotland class. And he said that um, obviously this was a government decision, but it could be that in the future a few more submarines are procured um, to bolster Sweden's fleet. No decision of, on this has been made yet. Um, but he did note that it is um, not necessarily... Op, uh, optimal to just buy and build two new ones however he mentioned that future submarines wouldn't necessarily be a26s they could be an entirely new class or they could be just going back to these new a26s um, but all that's kind of up in the air and that was kind of just theorizing what might happen in the future um, it's not like certain that sweden will um, go on to buy more um, but yeah, so Swedish programmes, obviously a big thing here at UDT. Further to this UDT coverage, I spoke to Anders Magnafelt. Now he is one of the speakers here at UDT. He is Managing Director of JFD Sweden. And I discussed with him military diver capabilities, which was one of the focuses from the UDT conference. I started by asking him why this was now such a timely topic. UDT has, has traditionally been focusing on, on submarines and, and uh, submarine roles. And, and, and uh, the support to special operations hasn't been, been uh, really on, on that focus. But in later years, it, it has been more focused on, on this. And uh, we are now uh, seeing that a significant growth in, in, in navies looking to develop specific maritime skills for special operations, uh, for counterterrorism and uh, other areas of covered, covered operations. And what are the main challenges facing military divers today? Military divers often carry out complex missions in challenging environments with high threats, where the cost of any error or incident can be severe. And, um, and safety and OPSEC is, is paramount to requirements uh, today. Through, through the, our approach to product, service and operation excellence, we will work to provide customers with the safest standard of water operation environment as possible. And are there any key technology limitations at present? Yeah, there are, are limitations for the divers and, and, and uh, it's, it's uh, mostly co to combine to the physics and the physics around the divers. And, and uh, I'm thinking about the endurance of the divers. Uh, we, have, we have very good systems to get the diver underwater and to perform underwater, but the uh, endurance is limited. And that's an area where I hope uh, that, that uh, we, we together can, can, can uh, reach forward. So I guess following on from that then, which technologies are presenting themselves as a response to this? Yeah, we, we have our, I mean, for endurance in the range of the divers, there is, a, uh, there is a limitation to the divers how far he can swim with all the equipment needed to do the mission. There are uh, sealed, uh, or swimmer delivery vehicles and uh, systems that are, are within that uh, uh, will increase the range for the divers and, and uh, his sustainability. And we, we uh, provide a range of STVs all the way from small 
two man vehicles all the way up to squad uh, size uh, STVs. Which trends or technologies of the future will we see kind of more of to improve the safety and capabilities of military divers? For diving gears, we, we, I think we will see more of, of inbuilt bailout systems, that redundant systems to, and, and customized harnesses with inbuilt uh, protection against uh, a small, uh, small fire, and, and etc. And uh, looking forward, GFD maintains a continual aim to com- uh, combine uh, engineering excellence and expertise uh, interoperability in joint operation is a key su- to success. And I, I think that the industry and, and us and others that is in this area, we, we have to, to uh, uh, be engaged with the military to, to make that happen and make them understand that it, it needs a joint uh, doctrine, not an, an, a national uh, doctrine. Thanks a lot, Anders. Thank you. So that was Adnas Magnafelt from JFD Sweden discussing their military diving capabilities and the technologies employed within this sphere. From the iTech side, our reporter Kate Marta caught up with CAE's Vice President and General Manager for Europe, Mark Olivier Saburun, on military pilot training demands, key European programmes and new technologies. C estimates the pilot shortage in the civil industry to be about 300,000 pilots in the next 10 years. This uh, this pressure on the civil pilot sector will affect the defense sector as well, pulling in experienced pilots from the defense sector. So CE has built a lot of experience on NFTC, where we train pilot uh, fighter pilots, and DOTAM Alabama, where we train Army fixed-wing pilots to the magnitude of 500 uh, to 600 new pilots per year. This experience where we leverage both synthetic and live flight training operations and optimize the training systems will apply very well here in Europe, (laughs) where the pilot shortage will hit military forces in the years to come. So C has been recently awarded by General Atomics, the, uh, the UK protector program, where CAE will develop with General Atomics and in collaboration with the UK MOD, a new training system or the most modern training system for GA's latest uh, UAV platform, which will be authorized to fly within commercial airspace. So this is a significant new training program that will enable UAV to fly with defense pilot within commercial airspace. Um, Another program of interest is the UK MLSP, so the Merlin Sustainment Program, which... uh, uh, for which CE will fill two of its new products, the 700 MR FTD, which is specialized for doing mission training of helicopter pilot, as well as a back end which uses a very modern and very high fidelity mixed reality package, which allows physical interactions with the complete back, back end crew and a virtual experience of the outside world. A third program I, I might be talking about is a program where we are currently in negotiations with Leonardo and the Italian Air Force to create uh, the International Flight Training School in Italy to train Phase Four fighter pilot. So on on the uh, on the IFTS program, uh, it's a mix of life flight training using the uh, M346 aircraft, which is the latest in its generation and most advanced trainer program, which incorporates not only very, uh, very advantageous flight dynamics, but also embedded simulation, which allow to download again training that you do on operation platforms to the simulator. And a combination with uh, live virtual constructive, the aircraft can be connected to the ground training system which has, again, an uh, absolute replica of, of the, the training aircraft, and the two can operate together and train in a much larger exercise and therefore have much more advanced training and much more much advanced qualifications at the end of the training program. I'm here with Richard Thomas, our editor-in-chief. Now, Richard, I understand you've got a very special offer for our listeners. 
Yeah, that's right, Helen. Um, as, as, we, as we all know, um, nowadays journalism comes at a price, as, as it should. And much of our original news content is only available to our subscribers, uh, including much of what we talk about on this podcast. But we are offering an exclusive discount to listeners as a small reward for supporting the podcast and using the code PODCAST50, that's uppercase, listeners can get a 50% off a premium news subscription to provide the access to all the news and analysis from the team here. Thanks, Richard. So to take advantage of this offer, head to subscriptions.shepherdmedia.com, sign up for the premium news service and use the discount code CAPSLOCK, PODCAST50 for a half-price annual subscription. I'm Shepherd Media's senior reporter, Tim Martin, and I'm coming to you from CR Space Exhibition at the National Harbour in Maryland. I'm delighted to say that I'm joined by John Rusi, test pilot for the CH-53K King Stallion. Um, and John, if you just want to introduce your, yourself quickly to the listeners. Sure. Uh, John Rucci, um, Sikorsky uh, test pilot, experimental test pilot, um, formerly uh, Marine Corps uh, pilot, uh, flew the CH-53E for roughly 10 years, um, and then uh, came to Sikorsky in 2004 and started working the 53K program from pretty much day one. Thanks for that snapshot, John. Um, for those listeners who might be less familiar with the program, perhaps you could break it down a little bit before we begin talking about the capabilities, and, and then we'll get the speed, get up to speed with uh, where the, the test program is at the moment. Sure. So the um, the CH fifty three K, which is the uh, the heavy lift replacement program for the Marine Corps, um, is to replace their existing CH fifty three E fleet, which is um, coming up on years and service and, and has has performed you know remarkably. Um, and but is it's time to replace that with a newer aircraft. And uh, the the CH fifty three K, while it looks uh, very similar to the legacy aircraft that it's replacing. Um, I would say is is absolutely uh, n- nothing in terms of like the legacy aircraft. While it looks like it, it's a uh, completely modern aircraft. It's an aircraft that's been um, built with specifications and thoughts of survivability and maintainability and safety and all the things that when the legacy aircraft was designed in the 70s, um, there wasn't as much emphasis on that. And the emphasis was they needed a heavy lift aircraft, something that could uh, perform duties behind the line of troops. It can do um, you know, assault support missions, um, whereas they've realized now over time and how uh, warfare has progressed where there is kind of a, a fuzzy region of where battle lines are. Aircraft are exposed to threats all the time. So the 53K has been designed from day one with all that in mind for battlefield survivability and for the assault support mission. And the aircraft itself went uh, went through some testing in the uh, Yuma, uh, Arizona uh, testing ground for DVE. Can you tell us a little bit about what was explored then? Sure. So um, one of the um, requirements for the aircraft is uh, the, the the Marine Corps wanted what they would say a, a level one handling qualities uh, per specification. So they wanted an aircraft that um, could effectively perform under conditions of degraded visual environment. So you'll hear the DVE term. Uh, For pilots, we just call it brownout if we're in sand or whiteout if you're in snow. But effectively, it's the the absence of uh, visual cues uh, in that low landing hover environment that are critical to be able to land the aircraft safely without any, any drift, which is a big enemy to the aircraft, any kind of lateral drift. And you may hit something or an obstacle; it could cause a, a bad outcome. So, um, our requirement was to sh- you know, have a a solution for that. Um, the Navy, the Marine Corps, didn't specify what that would be. Um, we we um, uh, put in a fly by wire architecture that we'll we'll get into that um, really um, makes this aircraft in another level, in another category above anything that's been anything that's currently out there, and anything that. Um, in terms of other aircraft, of heavy lift aircraft, so or even medium lift aircraft, so yeah. And for for non pilots, then is that the, the if you can give us kind of a, a flavor of um, how you manage those conditions and what technology or instruments alongside fly by wire that that really helps to to manage the, the conditions for DVE? Sure. So um, it, it's kind of a um, 
the industry and uh, and and brownout in general, and you know the conditions that are uh, the dust in the landing environment has been something that's plagued all rotary wing aircraft um, for decades. Um, you can look back historically on mishaps that have occurred. Um, it's one of the leading causes of aircraft having mishaps, and um, it's not because of you know an enemy enemy fire. It's because of the dust and be, the ability to land the aircraft safely and, and, and to perform the mission. Um, the aircraft itself, um, there's generally three pillars that are looked for for a DVE solution, and this is kind of industry wide, not just you know a Sikorsky. Uh, philosophy, but the three pillars being you need an aircraft that is um, has stability through some kind of flight control system, an augmented flight control system. Uh, in our case, it's fly-by-wire, so it's 100% authority, has um, remarkable stability over conventional uh, partially augmented systems. Um, the other pillar would be to have some type of um, hover display symbology, whether that uh, be on an inside display, on a glass display, a modern glass display, or a heads-up display a daytime HUD or an MVG HUD um, that will at least give you the cueing that you are in a drift condition that you need to correct and something that you can actually fly off of. And then the third one would be a technology that still, I would say, is in an infancy and, and not really in, in production in any, in any case, which would be a technology that either looks it has the ability to look through the dust, which is really challenging because there's different kinds of dust everywhere. So... Um, for the 53K, we mainly, uh, the, the focus has been the fly-by-wire, the stability of the aircraft, and the selectable modes, as we call it, for the pilot. I mean, you know, they have options of what kind of command response we say the aircraft would have, and we like to affectionately call it as, like, it's the sports card mode, or it's the truck mode, or it's the, you know, standstill mode, you know, a position hold. Um, and then the symbology itself, which Augman says you lose the visual cues outside, you have symbology sets inside on the displays that give you what the aircraft is doing over the ground. So that's pr- the principal technologies that we employ on the 53K and what we've seen are very successful in our, in our um, work at Yuma. And one other successful milestone prior to DVE uh, was the external lift 36,000 pound payload in March. Um, what can you tell us about that? Yeah, so um, the the achievement of carrying 36,000 pounds, and when you look at that in terms of um, uh, an external load that's 36,000 pounds in an aircraft that weighs, you know, you know, basically not much more than that, so you're you know, almost carrying half of what the aircraft weighs. Um, underneath you, it has uh, you know it, it, it's remarkable for an aircraft to be able to do something like that. Where now you're you're really altering the characteristics, and the CG now is displaced somewhere underneath the aircraft vertically because of the load that's it's carrying at that point. Um, the what we're seeing with the 53K is that it's an aircraft that is really at the beginning stages of growth. That it has growth potential beyond um, the engines are brand new, and that's something that probably doesn't uh, or folks may not be aware of the, the T408 as the as it's been labeled by the, the Navy um, is a brand new engine that was developed for the 53k um, I likely would think it's probably going to have other applications because of the growth potential of the engine um, we see that you know the technology that it brings to us with full authority digital control which is not new to the industry um, newer to helicopters I would say you know in the last decade but uh um, offers much to the pilots in terms of giving them a real-time feedback of what the power uh, of the engines is putting out. And then it actually gives us the ability to cue the pilot to limits that are coming. And we've actually tied that in with the flight controls to give us tactile cueing, which is another big advancement of the aircraft, is that a pilot can fly something like a 36,000-pound load and the co-pilot doesn't have to be glued to the instruments and managing engine, you know, um, ability and, 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 you know, like matching either physically through throttle movements and stuff like that. Um, they can concentrate on the mission, which is we're going to pick this thing up and we're going to bring it over to some other place. So then the co-pilot duties would be uh, where are we going with it? Take care of those types of duties where the pilot can just look outside and when he feels in his, you know, collective application, he feels, say, getting a little bit heavier in his hand or we have, say, a shaker, which would tell you you have an impending um, limit coming on your engines, you can make a decision and you don't have to be so glued inside those instruments to get that data. It's just coming to you right in your hands, which is a nice advancement that we've made on the aircraft. And if we move 
right to present day then and what what's happening at the moment how many test aircraft are actually involved and can you give us a sense of what's being scheduled and, and how progress looks at the moment certainly so um the 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 principal the program itself was a four uh prototype development edm aircraft experimental uh, development models uh there was also a gtv a ground test vehicle which uh unique on this program the ground test vehicle was essentially a fully functioning aircraft. In the past, we've done power system test beds or we've done GTVs operated remotely. We've done other things like that. The GTV itself, which we had worked on and put hours on for years prior to flying the aircraft, um, was a fully functioning aircraft, which allowed us to work out a lot of bugs before we ever got the flight, which was really nice. Um, uh, So the GTV, the four prototype aircraft for flying purposes, um, fully, you know, uh, of varying levels of instrumentation, Um, some more than others for structural measurements and stuff, and others that are maybe principally avionics platforms, stuff like that. Um, Beyond that, we had um, systems development uh, aircraft that were the SDTA aircraft, as we call them. Um, They've been participating in other activities like ground activities, ground testing, um, electrical, electromagnetic interference and compatibility testing at Pax River. Um, we've, uh, actually one of those aircraft that was already accepted by the government, um, DD-250 would be the term, and they had the aircraft in custody down in Marine Corps Air Station New River, where they're doing maintenance demonstration, uh, testing. So they're validating the actual technical pubs, the electronic pubs that taking, you know, various pieces of the aircraft apart, putting it back together, um, redlining, making changes, and we have our own Sikorsky folks on hand with them to guide them through the process and make changes real time. So um, essentially you have, you know, many aircraft doing many different things with the principal four flying prototypes. So it's, it's given us a lot of flexibility having those other aircraft to do those types of things. And ahead of everything else that you're seeing, there's, a, you know, an effort on the, the maintenance side going on behind the scenes. So when the aircraft does hit the fleet in a few years, all the publications have been validated. Um, all the lessons learned are there, and uh, it, it should be. Uh, we're hoping to be a very success successful story from that. So we know we've already seen success. So, can you touch at all on the relationship between the test pilot and engineers? How you know if you see something that um, you know that you want to directly suggest making a change or something that you might prefer to see impl- implemented? You know how all that works. Uh, certainly. And uh, I, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, state that. So on this program, we were an integrated test team. So um, who can't be with me today are my military counterparts, my uh, Marine pilots from um, their test squadron, their development test squadron, HX-21. Um, we have been working since day one, since the light off of GTV with as much as possible. It's generally a split cockpit where we have a Marine in the cockpit with a, with a Sikorsky contractor pilot. And likewise, in the back of the aircraft, we have Marine crew chiefs that are always working, um, you know, flying and doing the duties of external load work and, and basic crew chief duties. Um, while we were out at Yuma, they were, they were the ones principally flying in the back. It was pretty much three Marines and one contractor pilot doing those tests. Um, as far as the job of the test pilot, uh, I often say they don't uh, – engineers <laughs> – Engineer doesn't like us very often because we're always telling them what's what's broken or what's wrong with their design. Um, uh, it's uh, the relationship that we've fostered with engineering is 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 rather unique in that we realize uh, and and the Marines are great about this when they come on the program too. Um, they get to work and they get to go to all the meetings with engineers, so they get to see not only maybe they find a problem, they write up the problem. We then go through the meetings and the process of how we fix the problem. Um, they bring a unique, you know, perspective of the customer of how and why this particular change is important. Uh, and of course, there's degrees of you know what changes are really needed and what changes are just kind of nice to have. And then there's always the discussion of well, is it in the spec? the original spec or is this growth beyond? So that's always a caution of any program is you don't want to get yourself to the point where you're making changes to what the original contract said because that's how you creep a contract and things get too expensive. So we're very um, cognizant of that and we always have folks in the meetings that are keeping us honest on that. Um, But it's, it's, it really is. I, I, I tell all the, anyone that comes onto the program new it's, we really work for engineering 
Um, we work for them, but we work with them and in trying to solve the problems that we see on the aircraft to make ultimately what the customer receives and, and to give them the best product that we can, you know. Um, so that's hopefully that kind of explains the process of what we do. Um, it's, it's a lot less than just flying the aircraft. That's probably about, you know, one tenth, if that, of what we do. So but it's a great job. I, I love it. <laughs> And the program of record for the U.S. Marine Corps is 200 aircraft eventually. So with, a, with some time, of course, you know, before any of that happens. But if you can give kind of a flavor then of what's left on, on the test program um, and right through to, to maybe when the, the Marine Corps will, will have uh, more of the aircraft. Um, so specifics on what's left, um, hard to kind of, you know, state that. The, the important thing is that, what we would call a shakedown of the aircraft, which is touching the areas of the envelope around the edges where traditionally you would have problems. We have done this. We've we've touched around the edges. We've made um, discoveries, and some of that's been very public discoveries that we've made um, and stuff that we're working through currently. Um, A lot of the other stuff was, well, we've touched along the edges, and actually, you know, it's as good, if not better, in some areas than we had hoped. And that's always goodness. So we're always striving not just to give, you know, what the letter of, say, contract is, but what capability we could give that might be beyond what they had asked. Because, you know, in some cases, not that some things are over-engineered, but there are capabilities that you find in, a, in, a, in any development program that um, are pleasantly better than what you had planned. And that's always a better outcome than when you fall short. So um, hopefully that answers the, the question of what you, what you wanted there. So. Certainly. And John, you've previously flown the, the Super Stallion. Is it nice to be involved at a, at a test level in something that's going to advance the aircraft technologically and um, performance and capability-wise? Um, absolutely. So um, coming to Sikorsky, uh, you know, to, to work on this, it wasn't my goal coming here to necessarily work on this project, but it, the timing of it worked out very well for me. Um, coming from the legacy aircraft where some of the biggest challenges were the DVE environment, the dust environment. And, and, you know, it's been ongoing since they've been flying in those environments and even the training that we do in the state. So beyond in theater, we're always training in different environments. Um, uh, having uh, had that experience and seeing, you know, what level of workload that the legacy aircraft um, brings and, and what the pilots and the crew resource manager that has to go into two pilots and, and two crew members in the back, sometimes more, three or four, depending on the mission you're doing, and how they all have to work cohesively together, um, seeing and creating this aircraft and, and working on this aircraft from day one and, and flying the aircraft now and seeing how markedly lower this workload has gotten because of the technology and because of the absolutely outstanding engineers that have created this fly-by-wire control system um, I flying it, you know, firsthand in Yuma, um, with, you know, my counterpart, uh, Marine Lieutenant Colonel and, and, um, combat crew chiefs in the back, um, who've flown in every theater in the last 10 years. And we're flying the aircraft in that same type of dust environment where typically, you, you know, you get a little amped up, especially on MVGs or anything like that. It, it tends to it makes you a bit nervous. It's like uh, game time when you go into that environment. Um, we were all very surprised and very happy how well the aircraft behaved in that environment and how low the workload was and how you could just hear it in the, the calming voices of the crew chiefs telling you, hey, I'm clear right and you can come down to land. And, and, and we're typically in that environment. It's a constant flurry of I'm browned out, browned out right, browned out. You know, it's a constant, you know, uh, discussion of, do we land or do we go around? Do we attempt this again? Which is one of the, you know, the, the points of the legacy aircraft is it requires so much training to be successful at that mission. It really requires a lot of training as most of the legacy mechanical systems do. Um, this aircraft, because of this level of augmentation, because of the fly by wire, um, it, it, it will not require that level of training to perform successfully the mission the first time. It, it, will, it will just naturally be something that if uh, the, they've flown it in the simulation environment, the aircraft flies almost exactly as it does in the simulator. And that was one of the things we discovered from even the first flights was 
flew a lot like the simulator. It's you know, remarkable how they, they can do that, you know. Um, so it, it, it's been a real joy just to be part of that and, and to see what I think will be a, an incredible product for the customer and, and the safety aspects of that and how um, it will prevent mishaps in the future from ever happening. Things that are kind of routine today that you hear about will go away because of this, this technology. It's a real game changer. So. Thanks, John. So unless you have anything else to add, any final thoughts? I mean, I think we can wrap things up there and look forward to tracking the progress of the 53K program as it continues. No, uh, that's, that's, that's about everything. Um, thanks for your time. Thanks for, thanks for coming to, to listen to our story on the aircraft and the success of the aircraft. So it's, uh, it's, it's going to be, it's going to be out there for a long time. So, um, really look forward to seeing that, seeing the, seeing it flying on the news and everything else all around the world. So thank you very much. Okay. Thanks again, John. Welcome to this week's Industry Voice, uh, brought to you in association with our sponsor, NAMO. Uh, I'm Shepherd Media's senior reporter, Tim Martin, and I'm delighted to be joined uh, by Andre Lund, uh, SVP for Communications at, at NAMO. Uh, we've both just stepped off the show floor here at, at CR Space in Maryland. It's been apparent to me, and I'm sure it's been apparent to you, that um, in terms of new technology and, and innovation, certainly on the platform front, mm-hmm. there doesn't seem to be a, a whole lot new. Um, and, you know, you take that against this, the presence of the IT companies. Mm-hmm. So, you know, where would we stand, I guess, and sort of what, what we're learning from, from the show itself? Yeah, from the show itself, I think it's a question of uh, users looking to get more from what they already got. So you're seeing a lot of systems being offered here that are incremental improvements, but also that are boosting some performance in some very critical areas where they've found themselves, uh, where U.S. and its allies have found themselves lagging behind. And looking at things that like, we're working on from NAMO's perspective, it's what we're calling the range gap, where uh, artillery and missiles uh, from U.S. and its allies are falling way short, literally, of uh, some of the systems coming out of Russia and, or out of China. And it's uh, a reason why the U.S. Army, at least, have put it, uh, a long-range precision fire as their primary uh, priority from Fusion Command. But I think this is something that we're seeing interest in from the Navy side as well, the Marine Corps side, because you're seeing an operating in the Pacific, and you are operating at a massive range disadvantage. That is going to hamper you in any future operation. And I think that sort of realizations of capability gaps that cannot be solved by introducing new platforms but have to be introduced by new uh, fixed by new systems and by upgrading what you have i think that's the major trend seeing we're on the floor here yeah and certainly that mention of the missile defense being an issue uh, was something that, that i took from uh, the undersecretary thomas model undersecretary of the u.s navy rather he was speaking uh, at a breakfast um to to navy colleagues and to to the press and and he mentioned that in any standoff particularly for the u.s navy um, as regards missile defense that uh you know the chinese systems would would you know as uh, either defeat or at least equal um the firepower of 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 america so that that's clearly something that that uh, is going to have to to be dealt with um, from the from the american side certainly absolutely completely agree and uh, we're seeing a very growing realization of this and uh, both reports from uh, think tanks are seeing it in statements from political leadership, also seeing it from uh, military leadership in the U.S. that they're realizing where these shortfalls are. And I think they're also realizing that they can't solve those shortfalls by these massive overarching infrastructure programs. Um, I don't think we're going to see another kind of future combat systems uh, approach that the U.S. Army had 10, 15 years ago because uh, they're realizing that a program that is that massive and that time-consuming risks being outdated before it's uh, even introduced. So it's these rolling upgrades, incremental investments, trying to f- fix the major gaps where they are, trying to find an overarching architecture then that this can plug into, make sure that it's not pulling in different directions, but that you need to be, keep up the pace of investment and innovation while also keeping your eye on a target like, okay, what is really changing in the operational environment? What is that we need to adapt first? 
how do we do address that without blocking further or future innovation in other areas? Okay, and, and away from developments at CR space uh, specifically this week, uh, Andre, you'll be at the Washington DC National Press Club for an event. Can you talk a little bit uh, about that and what your plans are on that front? Yeah, indeed. Um, what we're talking about there is the um, was a Norwegian American Defense Industry Conference, uh, and that takes place every year. And this year, uh, we're talking about some of the topics that have been relevant here about defense in the high north and the Arctic, but also about industrial base issues. And uh, what I'm seeing on the floor here and um, I've seen in uh, other developments recently is that we are more interconnected than ever and that we really are talking about an allied industrial base. And I'll be talking that on Thursday with the authors of a new report came, that came out of the Atlantic Council a couple of weeks ago on the National Technology Industrial Base, which currently includes US, Canada, Australia, and UK, uh, but which also discusses how to strengthen that ally cooperation. And the report makes no doubt about it. dramatic changes are needed if Western allied industrial base is going to be able to support uh, U.S. and its allies as it faces off these challenges from major powers uh, and prepares for potential uh, future uh, major power conflict. And does anything from the report stand out at, at this stage or anything that you'll be referring to at the event? If it's anything that stands out, it's just how critical the situation has become. And that just how dramatic changes are going to be needed. And uh, I think it's fascinating as how the report lays out how many of the systems are in place today regulating uh, defense cooperation and development and technology were really developed in the 60s and the 70s uh, when the situation was radically different from what it is today, where innovation and development work was predominantly conducted by governments. Today it's not. It's uh, by industry, and not even defense industry, it's by commercial industry uh, globally. So we have expert control networks, both in the U.S. and Europe, that are very conservative and are very about preserving a, an imagined advantage that we believe we have, which uh, was eroded a long time ago. And uh, it is not really suited to helping us develop something new uh, for the future together. And that is a common challenge and a joint challenge by all allies, not just the U.S., and uh, we need to work on that. Many thanks, uh, Andre, for your, your thoughts, not just from CR Space, but also what you'll be getting up to this week uh, on the road, and uh, we look forward to, to catching up with you again next week. Great. Thanks again. Pleasure talking to you. This episode of Shepherd's Weekly Defence Podcast was brought to you by our sponsor, NAMO. If you've enjoyed what you've heard, please head over to shepherdmedia.com to access all our news stories and subscriber content. We'd love to hear what you thought of the podcast, so please do subscribe, rate and give a review on iTunes or other podcasting platforms. Thanks for listening. editing this.